All right, what is up? It is me, Mr. Myers, here to teach you guys a little bit of American history. We're going to do something a little bit different this time. I'm actually using uh, Loom right now to record my screen, and you can see me down in the corner here in the bottom right. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Unit 4, which is launching the New Republic. It covers our presidents 1 through 7, so we're going to talk about George Washington through Andrew Jackson, okay? I know we've already watched Ed Puzzles, we've watched videos, and we have also done the presidential debates, so you guys know a lot about these presidents already. So I'm going to go really quickly through this slideshow so that way we're not doing all 140 slides because there is a lot here. But uh, I am going to post the slideshow as well so that way you guys can read through this and check it out. There's also some videos in there if you want to watch those. You totally can. They're really cool and they will help you learn, uh, especially if you've got the time. I recommend you watch them. I think you'll like them. But I'm going to cover the main ideas here, okay? So the main ideas because... It's going to be a little main ideas. I don't want to say quiz because it's not really a quiz, but there's just uh, 10 questions here that are the main ideas from Unit 4. So I picked 10 main questions, really one for each president, and then some extra questions uh, to really cover what I think is the most important stuff, okay? We don't have time to do the full test or anything like that, so we're just going to do those main ideas. Hope you guys are all doing well at home. Uh, and yeah, let's get started. So let's first start off with George Washington. I know I've actually talked a lot about George Washington as well. He's the most famous president, probably the most famous. Him and Abraham Lincoln are known as one of the best presidents. We've already talked a lot about him with the American Revolution and all that he's done uh, for our country already up until 1789 when he is elected unanimously as the first president of the United States. Okay. Uh, the biggest thing I want you to know for Washington uh, is really that he's going to set the precedent for how our country is going to be run. So what I mean by that is he's the first. So he's the one who who's the first is in charge and everybody's looking at him of what the president's going to do. He did not want to assume too much power, didn't want to be a king like King George III in Great Britain. He wanted to have our country separating the powers like our constitution says, okay? Uh, so with that said, you can see here is his cabinet. You have TJ, Henry Knox, Hamilton, and Randolph, some of the best cabinet we've ever had um, just because of those brilliant individuals, okay? The Whiskey Rebellion was really quick. We talked about that, how he just basically said our laws need to be enforced. So he took his militia out and he enforced that they do have to pay this tax on whiskey. All right, moving quick. That was 13,000 state militia troops and that's him on his iconic white horse named Nelson. All right, moving forward, the French Revolution. The big question was, should we actually go to and help out the French in the revolution? There were two sides because they were also working for their independence on yes and no. Overall, we decided no uh, because we wanted to focus on neutrality and isolationism. So Washington was very big on this idea of staying isolated, not focusing on other people's problems, and really just working on America and our own issues. Okay, So that's why we did not go over to the French Revolution. It also was getting too violent with the guillotine, so we didn't want to get involved. Involved, um, with all of that and wanted to just instead focus on America. So when we look at him, uh, this is probably what he's most famous for, which is ironic that his, him stepping down is what he's most famous for. But this farewell address is really interesting because he actually chose after two terms, so eight years, two terms, two four-year terms, that he's going to step down and would not run again for president. At this time, there is no rule for how long you could be president, but he did not want to be the king and be a king forever and to pass down hereditary down by his oldest son or however it would uh, work um, in America. He wanted it to be uh, a true democracy where the people are going to vote for the new president. Okay, So because of this, he steps down and he gives a farewell address where he's going to talk about what he thinks is most important um, and what he hopes to our country will do. He basically gives advice. Though a couple of things he warns against is alliances with other countries because alliances brings us into wars and our country's too young to get into those wars. He also, like I've already mentioned, talks about neutrality and isolationism to really focus on America. So now that after he is done, there now has to be another president. So now the second president is his first vice president, who is John Adams. Now, John Adams is not as well liked as George Washington. Washington's this American Revolution War hero, a larger than life figure, uh, you know, a great athlete, super tall. And John Adams is just a little bit different. So he's going to be taking over and it's hard to follow George Washington's footsteps. As we go into Adams, um, you know, he is getting support from the North, the Federalists as well. So this, and if you know the parties like we've talked about in class, uh, you know what I'm talking about. These are your lawyers, merchants, ship owners, business people like that. Um, and Thomas Jefferson, who was the first Secretary of State, is going to be running against Adams. But what you're going to notice is that Adams is able to pull it off. 
The first problem he has is actually he's going to pass the Alien Sedition Acts. Uh, this was, you know, in hope to get rid of spies, like French spies and people in the country, but it also was to stop people from talking bad about him. So there were people that were talking bad about him and his party, so they passed what is known as one of the worst laws ever passed. That's the Alien and Sedition Acts. Basically saying that they could take people and throw them in jail if they said anything bad about Adams or his party, which completely goes against what we already know about the First Amendment, freedom of speech and freedom of press. So because of this, this is going to be hated and eventually banned and get gotten rid of, but it really leaves a bad uh, legacy for Adams having this actual act passed, okay? Some states are going to nullify it as well. Nullify just means to refuse to follow the laws. So they said that they will not follow this law because they think it is wrong. One big factor from this is actually just moving along really quickly is Jefferson's going to be elected in the next election. So we will get to Thomas Jefferson really soon. Um, just keep this in mind as everything's going on. I'm going to go through this quick. But in the meantime, we are trading with France and Great Britain. So we're crossing the Atlantic Ocean with ships, trading supplies back and forth. And with that going on, um, our ships are actually getting attacked because France and Great Britain are having a war with each other. So because of that, when our ships are going to Great Britain, the French are intercepting them, attacking them, taking the supplies. When our ships are going to France, the Great Britain is going and intercepting, attacking, and taking the supplies. So because of this, we want it to stop. Um, to give you a quick summary, right now we're going to try to avoid war at all costs. And so John Adams, what he said he's most proud about as his presidency is keeping us out of war. So uh, it, that, it was very easy for us to actually go to war. People were calling him and saying, you should, because we should defend our country. But he wanted peace. So he ends up getting a treaty uh, with Napoleon. And this ended up stopping, for the moment, them attacking our ships. However, it's going to keep happening very soon. Okay, so moving on, um, past the John Adams presidency into Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson is known as another one of the greatest presidents. Now, TJ, there are other things wrong with TJ, though. He's not just this perfect president. He did own slaves, which is, of course, totally wrong. And that was a part of his character. However, he also did um, have a couple cases of being against slavery. So it's kind of a lopsided, or I'm sorry, kind of a um, imbalanced uh, person here when you talk about his beliefs. But we're going to talk about the election of 1800, where you're going to see that John Adams is uh, going to go against Thomas Jefferson, and it's going to be a very, very close election. This election actually was a tie, which is crazy to think about how close this election was. It truly was a tie. So looking at the results, you can see we have Thomas Jefferson, Republican, Virginia, 73 electoral votes. Aaron Burr, Republican from New York, 73. My man, John Jay, got one whole vote for president. Way to go, John Jay. You're the man. But basically what happens here is since it's a tie, it has to go to the House of Representatives. So it goes to the House, which is a part of Congress. And in this, they end up tying again. What kind of breaks this tie is actually after 35 ballots, Hamilton steps up. Now, Hamilton was a re well-respected uh, person amongst all of the political field right now. Hamilton was the first Secretary of Treasury. So he comes in to break this deadlock. And a quote that he says is that Jefferson is to be preferred because he is by far not so dangerous a man. He said Aaron Burr, who tied with Thomas Jefferson, ended up switching parties and not having a set beliefs. So it's kind of like someone you don't know who's what, what they're going to do. So because of this, they end up re-voting in the House and Jefferson gets elected. They then changed the 12th Amendment because the way the system worked right now is everybody passed, or, sorry, they passed the 12th Amendment. The way this worked is the electors actually voted for two people. And then um, what happened is the second person would become vice president. Now they run on the same ticket where you have the president and vice president. Okay. All right. So with that said, sorry if that might take a little bit long, but with that said, Thomas Jefferson is now the president. So with TJ as president, he is a Republican. So he supports farmers, limited federal government and strong state government. However, as he's president, you're going to notice this whole limited federal government. He's not always going to act with that. For example, with the pirates in Africa, he's actually going to send over the force himself as president, send over military to stop and attack these pirates. He's also going to purchase Louisiana Purchase in 1803, which ends up doubling the size of our country. And that at the time, nobody had ever done yet. So they were questioning, could the president even doing this? So he said himself that it's easy to have limited government until you're actually in that position. Okay, so we're still going to have issues with people attacking our ships. They're going to impress our sailors, which means kidnapping our sailors and force them into the British Navy. Um, you know, we're trying to avoid war at uh, an overall cost, but they are going to keep continuing to attack our ships. Okay, so Washington's solution, or I'm sorry, Jefferson's solution to this problem is actually this key word right here, embargo. Now, embargo means a complete halt in trade with other nations. 
that means we're not going to trade any longer with France or Great Britain. It's a really good idea to think about like, okay, then they're going to be so hurt without our supplies that they're going to be crawling back to us, begging us to ship and trade with them again. Um, however, um, it's not going to work that way. It was a good idea, an idea, but uh, when actually practiced, think about who would hurt the most. It's really going to hurt the Americans, and it's really the sailors and the merchants and the people that work on the docks that 55,000 of them end up losing their jobs, hurts our business and our trade. So this ends up getting repealed in 1809, the Embargo Act. And so because of this, this is a kind of a negative on Jefferson's presidency because this did happen. And impressment, which means the kidnapping of our sailors and the attacking of our ships is still going to happen and go on until we get to Madison with the War of 1812 when things do change. All right. So zoom in past Jefferson there. There is a lot more to talk about. He is a fascinating person. So hopefully you guys can learn more on your own. Uh, but I'm just giving you the big ideas here as we go on. Next, let's go to Madison now. So James Madison was president from 1809 to 1817. A great first name, I must say. Now with Madison, he is, remember, known as the father of the Constitution because he was the leader at the Constitutional Convention. He had the most of the ideas. He came with the Virginia plan, the idea of the separation of government, um, you know, the two houses where you have a house and a Senate. A lot of that was his idea. So he is a pretty famous person as well. Madison is also our shortest president ever at five foot four. Just a little fun fact for you. He was also one of the authors of the Federalist Papers, which helped get the Constitution signed. And he was Secretary of State, which, as we've seen, is a pretty good stepping stone for being the next president. Jefferson was for Washington. He ended up being the third president. Madison, he's going to end up becoming the fourth president. To give you another uh, recap, this is where our country is at right now. So you can see we have our original 13 colonies, and now it's expanding to all of this territory from winning the American Revolution. And then we also are going to get Spain. I'm sorry, Florida from Spain in 1819, so we're not quite there yet, but we're working our way there. We do have the Louisiana Purchase, which is what Jefferson made. Look at all this territory, which finally got the territory where we're currently located, Nebraska, in 1803. Now, I didn't talk about this because we are going to get to it in the next unit, but this is when you're going to get Lewis and Clark who leave from St. Louis, and they're going to go explore all this territory looking for the Northwest Passage. But this all was unknown right now, so there's not a lot of true Americans right here, okay? All right, so moving forward, uh, the one big thing when we talk about Madison is we have to talk about the War of 1812, which was in 1812. Uh, the main goal here was protecting the sailors and settlers again. So what we're trying to trade, and we need to trade, it's for our businesses, but Britain and France continue to attack and seize our ships. So because of this, many want war, and it ends up, a couple things happen, is they even supply Native Americans, the British do. Remember, the British are also up in Canada. They were supplying Native Americans in the West with weapons to fight against our settlers as we're moving west. So since we have the Louisiana Purchase, we're trying to move west. But the Great Britain, I'm sorry, the British are supplying the Indians with weapons to fight back against us. So because of this, it's going to lead a couple to some battles. Um, one, um, I will go over quickly, but we have William Henry Harrison versus Tecumseh. Henry Harrison's actually going to become a future president, which is pretty cool, the ninth president. However, he serves the shortest term as he dies um, about a month into his term because he got pneumonia, uh, they think, from giving his inauguration speech when he first was president. Anyway, future president, but he was a military general at this time versus Tecumseh, and they think he might have been cursed by a Native American called the Prophet. All right, so the Warhawks right here, these are people who are pro-war. So if you see Warhawks, they want war with Great Britain, okay? But since Tecumseh was getting weapons from the British, they would actually um, gather a lot of Native Americans together. And you can also argue that they had the right to defend their own territory. This was their land um, that we were trying to move into and fight. So it is fair for them to defend themselves. Um, not really they're the bad guy. And we, they, we, if as in we, the Warhawks at this time wanted to force the British out of Canada. So we were thinking, and I've had kids ask me this in class, why don't we have Canada? Why don't we have Mexico? Well, we're going to talk about the Mexican-American war later. But for right now, we actually did try at this time, try to get Canada. So we'll talk about that in what is known as the War of 1812. So we did declare war on Great Britain. Britain was weaker from fighting fighting France at this time, which is pretty nice. Um, it made it a little bit easier for us to fight, but we are already in another war. So we think about Washington, he would not be happy with how quick we got into war. Uh, what we are going to try to do is invade Canada, and we try to take it three separate times. However, we fail each time. To save you the details, it's a lot easier to defend than invade and attack. I was thinking about the weather in Canada and our military uh, was not very well formed and balanced at this time. One part that is really interesting in the War of 1812, which a lot of people don't know, is the British captured and actually burned down Washington, D.C. in 1814. So this picture down here, when you look at the White House, our White House was burned down. 
One cool fact about this is actually uh, Dolly Madison, so James Madison's wife, who was able to take documents and save them, including a portrait of George Washington from the White House before it burned down. Other interesting story with this is there actually was a storm that rolled by and a tornado that actually sweeped and caused the British to actually have to leave the White House, which is interesting. They also sat down and ate dinner at the White House before burning it down in a form of disrespect. So yes, our White House is still in the same location as where it was back then. It just has been rebuilt and has been rebuilt in, in multiple editions on since. But that did happen in 1814. Another big thing that came from this war was actually the Star Spangled Banner, which originally was a poem written by Francis Scott Key. And now in um, Maryland, what actually happened is there was Fort McHenry. And McHenry was being bombed by the British, and that caused Francis Scott Key to have to sail away. And he wrote a poem, which is about the Star Spangled Banner. And I'll give you a chance to read it in class, but one quote here, and here at the bottom I said, And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Because he saw the American flag standing above staying flying even during all the bombings and that it was being attacked by the british giving hope to the americans that we are still there i also put this picture of fergie if you remember that from the all-star game uh but anyway and now it is sung at every sporting event every event um to honor our country all right so with the war um and I'll get to the ending here quickly, but basically another hero that comes from this is Andrew Jackson, who's going to be our seventh president. One thing is he defends our arguably most important port, which is New Orleans, which is at the bottom of the Mississippi River. Uh, but he actually takes 7,000 militia, free African-Americans, Indians, and pirates, even pirates to fight on our side to fight against the British. And we do great in this battle where 2,000 British have casualties and only 20 Americans do. So it's a huge victory for the war. One ironic or funny part about this, though, is that it didn't even need to happen. The war was actually officially over at this time, but communication skills were so poor that it still uh, Jackson still went down and fought in New Orleans because it couldn't get to that time. Uh, to tell them the war was over. So to summarize the War of 1812, it was the Treaty of Ghent uh, City where it actually ends the war. Um, and that's where they signed the treaty. Both sides actually claimed victory because we didn't get Canada. So they claimed that as a victory, but they didn't take over American territory. So we also claim that as a victory. Uh, either way, the one good part about this is fewer ships are going to be seized or taken and sailors kidnapped, which is good. Um, one, uh, I guess, uh, negative for the Native Americans and the British in terms of defending what they want to be the West is they do get weakened because of this war. Our national pride is very increased because we think we stood up to the British and we think we're very strong. So we're very happy. This patriotism, nationalism comes up. And the two heroes are William Henry Harrison and Andrew Jackson that come from this war. All right. I'm moving quick, but we're doing well. So let's go to Monroe. So the next president, also named James, is Monroe. So Monroe is going to take over in what is known as the era of good feelings because people are happy. We are patriotic. We're, we think America is great. We think we won this war. So things are happy. A little bit on Monroe's background, though, is he did negotiate with France, Louisiana Purchase for Jefferson. So he does have... Um, a background in politics. He also, again, was Secretary of State, which is a good stepping stone for president. He was president in 1817 to give you another idea of when we're at. All right, so let's keep moving on here. Uh, James Monroe did also sign the Missouri Compromise. So with the Missouri Compromise, one issue when you are adding states is about slavery, okay? So when this basically solved is we want to keep the balance even between slave states and free states at this time. So what they decided is anything below this line is actually going to be a slave state and above is going to be free. When you notice uh, soon as we're going to add states, they're going to add a state as a slave state and also add a free state to keep things balanced. Now, you know why? Because of Congress. So when every state you add, they get two votes in the Senate uh, for each. This way keeps the Senate balanced, okay? So Missouri is going to become a slave state, and Maine up here becomes a free state. So that's how those two states entered the Union with the Missouri Compromise. All right, moving on. Uh, now, Latin America at this time, there's going to be revolts because we inspired a lot of other countries. The American Revolution is incredible. It inspired the French. It also inspired a lot of people in Latin America, including Mexico, to revolt for their independence, in this case, against Spain. So they revolt against Spain, and Miguel Hidalgo actually revolts against them. He leads it, uh, and they end up getting their independence. Other countries do as well, such as Venezuela and Colombia and Bolivia. Uh, they also get their independence from amazing leaders that you should learn more about. Um, however, this is just American history Class, so I do have to go quickly through this stuff, but they do gain their independence. So now Mexico is their own country. It's no longer Spanish Mexican territory to the south of our borders. 
Uh, so that's pretty cool that we do inspire this. Uh, one thing is with these revolutions is now other European countries are going to want to put down these rebellions. So they're going to want to come west, put down the rebellions, stop them and stop people from being free uh, in their own government. So we want to stand up for freedom. We were the ones that had the American Revolution. We want to help out the people that are also fighting for freedom. So what that leads to is the Monroe Doctrine, named after James Monroe, our president, where he is going to... Um, officially give a speech that's known as the Monroe Doctrine and become this famous doctrine that helps support these free and independent countries, saying the Americas are now closed to colonization, so you are not allowed to come west. So Great Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, all of those countries, you're not allowed to come west anymore. You're not going to colonize like you did um, back in the 1600s. It's not going, to how it's not going to be how it's going to work. So America becomes this national power after this. We gain a lot of respect now, uh, making a statement to other countries, telling them what to do. Uh, and if you see on this picture right here, you get an idea that everything west of this line is going to be the Americas. So you guys stay away and we'll stay out of all of your territory in the Eastern Hemisphere. No trespassing as that picture up there shows. We also get Florida. Um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more next year, but Jackson's going to do some raids down in Florida and then we're going to acquire it in 1819. So I'll talk to you more about that later when we actually add in people or other add in our countries. The American system is going to come into play. I'll talk to you about more about that in a little bit. But one cool thing that's happening right now is transportation. So with roads and canals are being built. So if you see this map right here, what it's showing you is in one day, if you were in New York City, that's how far you could get in 1800. And then in 1830, you could get that much farther due to roads and uh, canals being built. Canals are basically a water road that allow you to go to, from one place to another with a boat. Uh, this is right here in 1840, which shows you all different types of canals. Probably the most famous is the Erie Canal right here. Uh, the Erie Canal right here, connecting Lake Erie and Lake Ontario all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, which is huge for trade, allowing people to get their supplies all the way across. Okay? All right, sweet. Uh, we're actually going to talk about money later, and you're going to talk about symbolism. So uh, one assignment we're going to be doing is this, where you're going to be reading about what symbolism is, uh, especially on our currency, because it does have reasons. There's reasons why things are on there. And we're going to be completing this assignment of what you guys think these symbols mean, like the seal, uh, and what these words mean, and then what they actually mean from the article. So I'm going to skip this for now, because we're going to do that assignment. But that stuff is really interesting as we talk about it. One quick thing I do want to actually explain, because this is pretty cool, is the e pluribus unum which is latin and that means out of many one so out of many people we have one country out of many states we have one country out of many we are one country one government one governing body and that's kind of our slogan for our country all right cool moving on to john quincy adams we're almost done we just have jqa and jackson and then we're done okay so stay with me so jqa is john quincy adams he is the son of john adams john adams only served one term by the way and spoiler if you notice john quincy also only serves one term so it does run in the family i guess he is the first president to have an official photograph taken of him which is pretty cool he also was, and I've said this many times, but a Secretary of State, which gives him government experience to get in that position. He did write the Monroe Doctrine, which was that speech, so he is uh, well-versed in terms of foreign affairs as well. So the election of 24, this is actually probably the most important part of John Quincy Adams because it talks about what would happen in terms of really close elections and also how the government can be corrupt. So first off, we have running for president. We have JQA versus three other people, Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson, who we know is going to be the seventh president, and William Crawford. Okay. So first off, no one won enough electoral college votes. Currently, it's 270. Back then, it was a different number uh, based on the population of the country, but no one won enough. So if you see, nobody had over 50% of the electoral vote uh, to actually get enough. They had 38%, 32%. But the person who got the most was Green, who's Jackson, and then Pink, who is John Quincy Adams. Even in the popular vote, it just means the amount of people that are voting. 153,000 voted for Jackson, however, 108,000 voted for John Quincy. So if you notice, there's a difference here. Jackson had the most votes, so he probably should be president. However, what happens is the corrupt bargain. So this is, you know, a conspiracy, but is true here. Uh, but John Quincy Adams, under the table, what happened is he says, you know, the Speaker of the House, because the vote goes to the House since there's not a majority, was Henry Clay. He told Henry Clay, if you get your supporters to vote for me, I will make you Secretary of State. Now, I've mentioned this multiple times, but you guys know the Secretary of State is like a stepping stone to becoming president. So he tells Henry Clay, get your supporters to vote for me. I'll make you Secretary of State, and then I'll set you up to be in a good position to then run for president. So what happens is exactly that. And then John Quincy Adams gets elected president, even though Jackson got more votes, and that's known as the corrupt bargain, which 
really ruins the rest of John Quincy Adams' presidency because people find out and they end up not trusting him. And then he tries to pass things through Congress and he doesn't get anything done because they don't trust him and don't like him. So his presidency is going to be tough. The one thing that is um, does happen is, like I've already talked about a little bit, but he is going to be supported, and this is progressive national system in building roads and canals. So here you can see a canal right here um, being built, this water road, and it's going to allow people to be transporting, moving around faster. Think about how now you can just hop in a plane and fly anywhere in the country. It's crazy. Back then you couldn't. Remember, you know, we just have um, these roads for horses and and, and carriages. And then we have these boats. That's the fastest way to travel at the time. But the Erie Canal is very important because it links the Great Lakes to the East Coast and allows people to travel. Okay. Um, we also did provide Native Americans with territory in the West because you keep in mind, we are looking to expand West and West and West, but most ideas are going to be shot down. So what's going to happen is actually the next election, Jackson's going to win easily. Jackson's going to win easily in this election. It's not going to be hard. John Quincy Adams does end up serving the rest of his life, speaking in the House of Representatives, um, which is amazing. He actually continues to serve there until his death. He's actually speaking on the floor and has a stroke and dies uh, in, in 1848. But how incredible is it that he truly loved government and believing in the process so much he served until his death. So he is a very interesting person. Now, Jackson's going to be elected, and one of the biggest reasons he wins so easily is he is known as being a man of the common people, okay? Because he was born into poverty, okay? He wasn't like these other people that were actually founding fathers or, you know, all this other lifestyle. He was born into poverty, ends up joining the militia, and becomes gets a pretty good life for him. His nickname's Old Hickory, by the way, because he was really tough, and Hickory is known as the hardest wood, so he was tough as wood. Um, but he is known as the person for the common people. He gets support from the general population, and one of the biggest things about this is there's a new change in laws where people that now did not own property could vote. Remember, at this time, only white men could vote. And at this time, before this, was you had to also own land. Well, now, even if you didn't own land, you could now vote, which is why Jackson gets so many votes. He ends up creating what's known as the Democratic Party, who are these ordinary farmers and workers and generally was the poorer population. And he thinks that these common people should control the government, not the rich. So that's one of the reasons why Jackson is very popular. He, by the way, is a very controversial figure. He did a lot of good things. However, he did a lot, a lot of bad things, some very terrible. So it's very good and bad. He is on our $20 bill, so he is remembered um, in multiple different ways. I'm only talking about this quickly, and that's actually the spoil system down here. One thing that he does do on the negative side is actually rewarding supporters uh, with jobs. So if you support for me, if you pass my laws, if you vote for me, et cetera, vote for the laws that I want, I can give you a job. Like, congrats, you can be the mailman. I'll make you ahead of the mail, and it'll actually give you a good job and good pay. So he ends up giving people jobs for votes, and that spoil system shows how corrupt, again, our government can be and not always pure and honest. Uh, we're going to move on here to the nullification crisis. Uh, what's going to happen is we're going to Congress is going to raise tariffs. Tariffs, by the way, is a tax on imported goods uh, to encourage manufacturing. The North is happy, the South is mad, and the South is mad because they have cotton sales in other countries. So they don't like high tariffs. That is not good for them. So they think this favors one region of the country. So they refuse to follow it. Okay. Uh, what's interesting is they actually threaten to secede, which means leave the Union. We're going to talk about secession a lot when we get to the Civil War, where the South secedes from the Union. He actually threatens military action against South Carolina and eventually backs down because of this. Okay. Uh, moving on, the National Bank actually is going to be still founded, and it's actually going to get down to zero debt for the first time ever and the only time ever under Jackson's presidency. The most important thing we got to talk about with Jackson is actually uh, the worst part of his presidency and one of the horrible times of American history, and that is true, I've talked about this with Columbus and any president, is Native Americans were on this land first. Native Americans were here, right? And we were the ones that came in, or sorry, Europeans were the ones that came in and ended up taking the land and forcibly taking it because of the power and the weapons and advanced technology. Uh, and this is no different right here. So as we are buying more territory west, we want to move west. But we also want to move south into territory as well, like Florida and Georgia. Okay. So because of this, um, there's going to be issues with Native Americans. And one is they're going to call these people the five civilized tribes. You can see them over here, the five tribes. The reason we called them civilized is because they had assimilated what assimilated means is adopting American or culture, values, language, the way they dress, 
um, the way they farm, things like that. So we called them civilized just because they were acting like us. However, they weren't in civilized or uncivilized. They were just living their own lifestyle. What's going to happen is they're going to make deals where we're going to sell the land, but due to language barriers and to them, they didn't understand the idea of owning land. Remember, everybody could live off the land and use the resources, but they're going to sell their land for pennies and move west. Some are going to fight back. There are going to be fights like the Seminoles, if you know, Florida State, that's like their mascot, but the Seminoles is a Native American tribe. They're going to actually be fighting back, um, and it is going to lead to some violence. Overall, though, most of them are just going to be treaties to protect the land. Um, and it's going to be fought in court because they have the right to stay there. What's going to happen is the Indian Removal Act is going to be passed. And so the president can make treaties with Native Americans. And because of this, these treaties of selling their land for pennies, super cheap, is going to go down. And then they can force them to stay. That's Jackson's and the government's argument. They end up going to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court even rules that these Native Americans have the right to stay. However, Jackson ignores the Supreme Court, sends down the military, and forcibly removes these Native Americans in what is known as the Trail of Tears, one of the saddest times in American history where the Cherokees, a Native American group, were forced to march 800 miles to Indian territory, which is really like the Oklahoma region. So marching, walking, 400 miles, given poor food, terrible conditions in the snow, dying of disease, being forced to move along, right? Not riding horseback or anything. And they had to go west of the Mississippi River. So, so many miles. Uh, think about just running a mile. Now imagine walking 800 of them, right? Incredible. And because of this, this all causes 4,000 out of the, 4, the 17,000 to die along this journey. And one is of the worst parts of Jackson's legacy and presidency. Uh, because of how we treated Native Americans. So you have to remember, think about empathy and feeling for these Native Americans who were just here living on this land. And then think about Jamestown and all the pilgrims and everybody who came since and ended up taking the land and forcing them to move west. So you have to remember that um, there's two sides to every story and Americans are not always the good guys. Here's a map to show you. Um, now they were shipped in some cases, the Seminoles were to then be moved. But you can see from Georgia, they were marched all the way along in a couple of different paths. Uh, to what will become like some Oklahoma territory. Another picture of it, and you guys can see more about the tragic Trail of Tears um, in videos that we have watched in class. Uh, the Native American population has sadly declined as well and actually gone into different locations, um, into small, small territories. You can see these reservations where they're allowed to live today and have actually very... Um, tough lives in a lot of cases. Alcoholism is popular there. Uh, very poor populations you often see because of the repercussions of what we've done and trying to force them to assimilate to our lifestyle. All right, so to end with um, Old Hickory or Andrew Jackson's death, he actually dies of some heart issues because of the poisoning. He actually was in multiple duels throughout his life with the guns and duels like we talked about with Hamilton, and he gets shot and actually uh, dies because of the poisoning from the duel, which is pretty interesting of way to die and he did uh die in 1845 all right so we did it sorry that video might be a little bit long but i wanted to talk to you guys about those one through seven presidents and just the main ideas there here's this this little 10 question quiz to talk about oh i did forget there's one other thing that i forgot to mention there is capitalism which is the type of economy that we have now which is based on private ownership so that means that we have private businesses where people can make money that means there's competition where everybody wants to make money so they try to sell products cheaper or they try to make new products and innovate to create new products there's good and bad to capitalism but overall it is good to create better items and cause a very well-based economy that is good for consumers uh, that is the type of uh, economic system that we have today Okay, sorry. So those are the 10 questions I want you guys to answer on the Google form. It's not officially a quiz, just to see if you guys understand uh, the main ideas from the presidents one through seven. And we will move along in talking about how we got actually the territory from the Atlantic coast uh, to the Pacific coast. And that is the next unit. Thank you guys for listening. Let me know if you have any questions. See ya.